Chapter 12 must go on. So, you think you have what it takes to beat me on my stage in my town? Come on down. We'll see. Breakfast. I hoofed a small pile of bottle caps across the sheet metal counter, while a scarred pony with a dark tan coat and a roasting meat cutie mark pulled a rabbit shish kebab from the barbecue grill. Guests or not, we were expected to pay for our food. I'm not sure why I had expected otherwise. I picked up my meal, the savory aroma assaulting my nostrils, and carried it over to the table where Calamity had already been digging into a bowl of oatmeal. Little Pip, what are you doing? Velvet Remedy, nearly shrieking as she saw me approach. I stopped short, looking at her quizzically. Velvet Remedy looked stricken. You're not going to eat that, are you? I nodded, unable to respond with the shish kebab still in my mouth. My stomach was rumbling and I sucked in a bit of the escaping drool, and I was hit by the flavors of the barbecued rabbit. I wasn't... it wasn't quite what I was expecting, and it made my stomach do an odd lurch. But it was good. Little Pip? Velvet raised a hoof to her chest, in exaggerated offense. That's meat! Uh-huh, I mouthed through my breakfast, hoping in vain that having established this fact, I would be allowed to eat in peace. Velvet Remedy's eyes narrowed. We're vegetarians, she said flatly. I paused at that. True, all I had ever eaten in Stable 2 was apples, but I had assumed that was because that was the only thing we had for eating. And I felt it would be perfectly happy never eating another apple as long as I lived. I thought back to my first meals outside how I had found cooked meat stored in a refrigerator, and simply assumed that's what ponies ate in the wasteland. My stomach had found it uncomfortable, but I figured that was just more of a result of a lifetime of apples, and the outside food would just take some getting used to. For the most part, I had felt acclaimed well. Of course, now that I've thought about it, that was a raider refrigerator, so diet was suspect. Calamity pulled his head out of the oatmeal bowl, winging in on the conversation. Oh, we can eat meat all right. Just don't, must, men don't like to. Ain't really good for our diet. Calamity looked sideways, his oatmeal-covered lips curling to a frown. My brothers used to challenge me to hot dog eating contests which mostly meant them shoving them disgusted things down my throat. Velvet Remedy looked appalled. Of course, they were probably disgusting more because they were 200 years old than because they were meat. I felt my appetite slip. Ugh. By Celestia's grace, I hoped that they'd at least seen or have been kept frozen for the entire time. Velvet Remedy turned up her nose and trotted away from our table. She was just leaving as God alighted next to us with a plate of roasted rats. She watched Velvet shudder in disgust and quicken her pace. Sucked up, sucking up a rat by the tail and swallowing it whole. God turned to me and asked, What's her issue? I suppose you'll be heading out after breakfast then, God asked, between bites of grilled vegetables and rabbit meat. I had told God about Red Eye's forces, and she'd taken it with a grave expression. Do you want an escort? It was a question that had plagued me all night. Not the escort issue, but leaving now in the first place. We could leave now, put Shattered Hoof behind us completely, and get out before the impending drama, and leave these ponies to the fates they had created for themselves. It was, I had to admit, not without its appeal, especially considering that the alternatives would almost certainly involve getting shot at, with a high chance of dying. Was there anyone or anything here worth risking my life or the lives of my companions? 
I... I've been considering staying, I admitted, just for a little longer. God would smirk at that. On the other side of the bottle cap, I didn't have any place else pressing to be. I didn't have a home, and the one friendly town that I had encountered so far had just kicked me out. So, I was still as lost and adrift as ever before. I felt like I had in Stable 2, when I was without my cutie mark, without a place. Same feeling, only the walls had changed. Even the ceiling was still gray, just higher. I was the pony with a pip buck on her flank. A symbol that didn't mean anything special in Stable 2. It didn't mean anything special in the wasteland at all. Watcher had told me to search for my virtue. What virtue did I have if I walked away? Okay, sanity, perhaps. Was sanity a virtue? Self-preservation? Truth be told, I didn't really have a larger mission. Personally, I found slavery a vile practice, and I wanted to take on Red Eye. And yes, I'd seen signs that Red Eye was involved in something big. But it was not only curiosity and worry that corralled me to investigate. I could leave under the spice that I was moving forward with the goal of stopping Red Eye, if indeed that was going to be my goal. But the small army over the hills were Red Eye's ponies. And if I really wanted to take on slavers, why not here? Maybe we should talk, Calamity told me, pointedly. God was staring at me thoroughly, obviously weighing opinions. And finally, she came to a decision. If you're interested in staying, I have a contract for you. I raised my eyebrows. Oh? How would you feel about taking out dead eyes for me? My ear shut up, and Calamity stared in surprise. Me? Why? God grimaced. Because if you don't, I'll have to do it myself. And while I'm convinced it's within the range of my contract with Mr. Topaz, to do so and the political fallout wouldn't be good. Deadeye's got a lot of supporters, and I don't relish watching for the spear in my back. I don't see how hiring us to take out this feller is going to make you any less of a target. Might not, God agreed, but it's worth a try. If, she added, turning her stare towards me, you're up for it. My mind reeled. Was I up to killing dead eyes? Hell, I'd already been wanting to do that. I'd been contemplating that more and more. But, to be hired to do so? I was already a vigilante. But, was I ready to be an assassin? I'd been out of the stable for more than a week, but less than two. If I did this now, what will I have become by the end of the month? By my next birthday? I... I'll have to think about it, I answered honestly. God frowned. Of course, she would want an answer right away. There isn't exactly much time. We had less than a day before Red-Eyes people marched into Shattered Hoof. It occurred to me that, considering what I knew of God and the Talons, she'd have more respect for me if I asked. What would we get out of it? What's the pay? I swear, the hint of a smile touched God's beak. Dead Eyes has a key. He keeps it hidden in his tail at all times. The key opens a vault under Shattered Hoof, down where the old mines are. Made sense. Naturally, a place like Shattered Hoof would be built on top of a set of gem mines. They couldn't have always relied on just the rock farms. And when the gem mines ran dry, what else was there to do but use them as storage? Dama Tiara's last message had even said something about sending the best gems below. What's in the vault? God smirked. Your payment, whatever that happens to be. Could be gems, could be weapons. Pre-apocalypse ponies use the gemstones from Shattered Hoof to build magical energy weapons. 
and considering that our armory was filled with them, it's a fair assumption the vault might have even more. The idea of storing a mass of magical weapons just beneath the prison seemed more than marginally insane to me. And after all, surely they didn't build the things there. But then, if I killed Dead Eyes, it wasn't going to be for the reward anyway. You can't do this! The old remedy stomped and snorted at about the cattle car. Empty, but for three of us. Little Pip, it's one thing to kill in self-defense, or to protect others. But this... She turned on me with a stare that could petrify the overmare herself. This is murder! Calamity was scowling. I have to agree with Velvet Remedy on this one, little Pip, he said flatly. I understand the Talons can't even respect him just a bit, but I ain't a mercenary. You can do this. I ain't with you, though. Velvet cut deeper. You know that song I was writing about staying noble and true? That was about you, little Pip. And this is you failing that on every level. To even consider this, she backed away from me, her voice softening with regret. I am so disappointed in you. I felt like I was bleeding out, dying. But the more I yelled, they yelled at me, the more I realized I had already chosen my course. I just had to make them understand why. Silver Bell. Both of them quieted, staring at me. After a long, pregnant pause, Calamity asked, What's Silver Bell got to do with any of this? I felt weak, but I clamped down on my resolve. Silver Bell's mother and father were murdered by the raiders, and they made Silver Bell and her sister watch. Do you remember that? I could see Velvet Remedy's expression quiver. Of course we... They made them watch. I emphasized each word with the stomp of a hoof. They made it slow. Really slow. And really painful. And really horrible. I asked again. Do you remember that? My companions were both silent. Those raiders came from here, I told them finally. And they were acting on Deadeye's orders. Spitting. I saw it for myself, in his ledger. Calamity spoke first. Well now, that changes things. And Velvet Remedy shook a little, but staying firm. What does it change? Ain't murder no more, Calamity stated without reservation. It's justice. Velvet shook her mane. Revenge, you mean? No, I mean justice. Pure and simple, Calamity nodded to me. I'm in. He glanced at my whore meaningfully. How's your TK? Rested wonders. I won't be juggling train cars, I admitted, but I think I can manage barrels. How's your wing? Velvet Remedy's eyes jumped between the two of us, over and over. And with a touch of desperation in her voice, she tried. Are you planning on finding out which raiders were involved in killing them too? Or are you just going to lay waste to the whole of Shattered Hoof? They're raiders, Calamity said evenly, shredding his wing. Honestly, I've been wondering just why you were helping them out at all. I figure, let them and the slavers duke it out. Stomp down, almost left. I had another idea. Actually, not every pony there is bad. I was thinking of the rock breaker I had talked to with while he was escorting me out. I think, I believe, this place could be turned around. Maybe become a trading town instead of a raider fortress. Even as the words came out, I knew they were stupidly idealistic. But I pressed on. I'm thinking, kill Dead Eyes, find Mr. Topaz and deal with him. 
amiably if possible, lethally if not, and leave Gaud in charge. Dead Eyes had told me to come back for one more job. Feeling the comforting weight of little Macintosh in my saddlebags, my sniper rifle, and the assault carbine that returned to my back and side, I suspected this wasn't the job he had in mind. But his invitation was the perfect opportunity. I left Calamity in the yard, reading through zebra infiltration tactics as I went in alone. He didn't like that one bit, but I had explained that I planned to take the very long way, explore some of the wings of Shattered Hoof I hadn't seen yet, including how to get down to the mine below. Seeing the yard in daytime for the first time, Clement had immediately spotted the metal plates of a hydraulic cargo lift, but the controls were damaged beyond repair. If it worked at all, it would only be from within the mine itself. There had to be another way. Somewhere, there was a door that went beneath the prison itself, and I wanted to know where it was. Now, I suspected I had found it. I was behind the stage in the mess hall. To one side, the curtains, heavy and stained, concealed this darkened space from the large catwalked area where the raiders ate whatever pa passed for their meals. Enough dust had accumulated back here that I could tell no pony ventured behind the curtain. Why would they? The space was full of rotting stage props and the skeletons of hundreds of ponies. Countless bones were stuffed into vial cabinets, spilling out of metal boxes, and formed piles that must have been three ponies high when they had still been fresh. The guests of Shattered Hoof had spiraled into barbarianism and cannibalism, and eventually every one of them had perished in here. I found logs. I'd found graffiti. And I wondered why I wasn't tripping over their skeletons. Above, a huge mural spanned the wall. The painting of the same noble-looking soldier pony I had seen on the back of Ponyville. Rearing up behind him, clear enough, even through the mural was badly damaged and faded, was the goddess Celestia herself. Her divine features beaming with approval. Originally, I realized this is what every pony who was a guest of Shattered Hoof would have seen each time they ate a meal, until the stage was built, hiding it away. There was a barred gate set into the wall, wide enough for a wagon to get through. Beyond a small kill zone, only a few yards deep, with two magical energy turrets set into alcoves in each side, powered down. Beyond, a thick metal door. Based on the dead light above, I could tell the door had no power. I wanted inside, and not because there was a vault filled with possible treasure. Only Dead Eyes had the key to the vault, and only Dead Eyes had seen Mr. Topaz face to face. If Mr. Topaz really existed at all, I was dead certain he was down in that vault. My mind was conjuring up images of everything from a dedicated computer terminal that allowed Dead Eyes to speak to a very remote Mr. Topaz, to the vault being a stable, to Mr. Topaz, the brain bot. The gate was locked, and I had to push aside mounds of crumbled bones to get to it. Holding my breath as white flakes stirred into the air, it took several minutes of effort, but the gate finally opened to my talents. The metal door, however, was another story entirely. It could only be opened by a terminal elsewhere in the building, and then, if only it was restored to power. I must have spent hours poking around Shattered Hoof, seeking to restore that power to, power to the door. It was just a simple matter of replacing a mouthful of fuses and swapping out a few rows of spark batteries but those proved annoyingly hard to find. I did find the armory through a side room off one of the guard barracks. 
It was completely devoid of weapons. No surprise, as most of the raiders seemed to be armed with magical energy weapons that I assumed were looted from the armory. There was, however, a framed news article on the back wall, and behind it, a safe. As I took the frame off the wall, the photograph caught my eye. The scene was in the midst of a light winter snowfall. The picture was of a funeral, and from the looks of it, a very important one. As the shadowy figures of the two winged unicorns stood in the background, badly out of focus. One was markedly shorter than the other, and my mind wanted to turn them into the goddess Celestia and Luna. But that wasn't what had captured my attention. The photographer's eye had focused on a mare, a single orange pony, who, unlike all around her, had shunned the formal black dress worn by others to wear only a black cowgirl hat and a black kerchief around her neck, with the image of a half an apple embroidered onto the front. The camera had caught a splash of light and glistened off a falling tear as she dropped a single beautiful flower into the casket. The mare's cutie mark, three apples, was identical to the design on Little Macintosh. All of Equestria mourns Big Macintosh, hero of Shattered Hoof Ridge. Two weeks ago, we didn't even know his name. But when Big Macintosh leapt in front of a zebra assassin's bullet, meant for Princess Celestia, dying instantly, he also leapt into the hearts and minds of every loving and patriotic pony, becoming a patron of courage, bravery, and self-sacrifice to all of Equestria. Funeral services were held this afternoon in the western courtyard of Ministry Walk. By the decree of Princess Luna, Pegasus ponies arranged for a light snow. The safe had opened to reveal two stealth bucks, and the last spark battery I needed, and a variety of ammo clips which, according to the documents I found in them, were magically enhanced. Bullets for Little Macintosh, the needle gun, and even Calamity's battle saddle, plus two types for weapons of a caliber I was unfamiliar with, although I suspected one was for the multi-barreled battle saddles I had seen the slavers use. I had just saddlebagged many treasures and was pulling the framed article back into place when the sounds of talking raiders froze me. Sure they ain't gonna blow themselves up all to hell and back on the landmines? One voice, a stallion. A youthful sounding mare snorted. Like I care much if they did. They have any you have any idea who those damn slavers did to my town? I hastily finished replacing the frame and hugged the wall behind one of the empty sets of ammo shelves. Here's alert. Ain't y'all from Littlehorn? Heard they massacred that place. Nah, but it would have been kinder to. They took all the mares and bucks they could, killing the rest and leaving them dead and rotting where they fell. But the colts and fillies? Red Eye doesn't have any use for kids. So they just left us behind to fend for ourselves. After a moment of awkward silence, she continued. Place went bad real fast. Hell, it was bad to start with. So many of us seeing our parents sliced and splattered. But it got a whole lot worse. I got my tail out of there as quick as I could. So personally, I'd be more happy if a good deal of this raiding party died screaming with their legs blown off. I could see the shadows of two shattered half, shattered hoof raiders moving across the floor of the armory as they walked past, too deep in their conversation to notice anything was amiss. Yeah, I get that, but if Deadeye's trap works, we'll have a whole mess of them slavers as our slaves. Then you can take it out on them, all slow and personal-like. I'm sure Deadeye won't mind if a few of his new rock breakers are missing one of them non-vital internal organs. Their voices faded as they turned a corner somewhere out of sight, 
I let the, out the breath I didn't realize I was holding. My mind raced to put together what I had just heard. Then I wasn't, then, wasn't betraying Shattered Hoof to the slavers, after all. He was just tricking Red Eye's forces into thinking he was, luring them into a trap. Of course, he wanted them to get in without any difficulties. And he was deceiving God into acting against him. Which, if this plan had the hoof stamp of approval of Mr. Topaz, or worse, was actually Mr. Topaz's plan, I needed to speak to God before I went shooting any pony. I want you to kill Gawad. I stared at Dead Eyes. This was the second task he had for me? Feigning ignorance as best I could, yet again. Who? Dead Eyes snorted. Godgina Grimfeathers. Griffin. Scar running up her beak and across her face. Only one eye. Can't miss her. He leaned forward with a sadistic smile. You do this, you're in. Part of my crew. Seeming pleased with himself, he sweetened the deal. Hell, I'll even make you one of my personal guards. You'll get a nice room and some of the better food. I was at a loss for words. He was playing me. I knew it. But I was totally thrown. I looked around like a drowning pony looking for a helping hoof. And once again, my eyes fell on the picture of Stable 2's first overmare, Sweetie Belle. I remembered something that Velvet Remedy had told me. Something the overmare had told her. Looking straight back into Dead Eye's slate gray eyes, I firmly nodded. Okay, not a problem. He blinked. Is that all? I asked, as if killing God was the easiest thing in Equestria. He raised his eyebrows. No, I think that will do. As I turned to leave, took a few steps and stopped, and looking over my shoulder. It's not like the ponies here won't suspect you. You should have an alibi. His eyes raged further. Tell you what. I've got a plan that will take care of your griffin problem and leave you looking clean. His eyes narrowed now. Oh, you do? Please, do tell. Ever heard of a pony named Sweetie Belle? Did I blink in surprise and then laughed? He pointed at the picture of the wall. Heard of her? I have every song of hers you can find in this wasteland. Do you realize she actually performed here? Right down on that stage. He pointed his hoof in the direction of the mess hall. Take the stairs just outside my office, and they'll take you to the balcony, where the friendship warden watched the performance. Wow. I'd hoped Deadeye was, was at least familiar with the mare he had on his wall, but I never imagined the sadistic bastard was a fan. He stopped gushing, his voice turning cooler. Why? I took a deep breath. Well, by now... You must know that I don't travel alone. One of the people traveling with me just so happens to be a descendant of Sweetie Belle. And it turns out, musical talent runs in the family. I had his attention. Her name is Velvet, and she's on her way to Manhattan to record some new music for DJ Poem 3's radio station. Wait, that's actually a pretty good idea. And it would give me a way to talk with the Wasteland's most famous buck. What I'm thinking. I think I can talk her into putting on a performance here. Using that very stage. My mind was racing. Trying to put together a decent sounding plan as quickly as I spoke. We'll do it tonight. Invite every pony to see it. And Godwinia Goodfeathers too. Dead Eyes, I could see, I was liking this idea. And with the battle coming tomorrow morning, he had to be figuring the timing for a morale-boosting celebration was perfect. I'll be hiding up in the balcony. I'll take two shots, one through the head of the griffin, and the other to your table, close enough to see 
that you were also likely a target. I levitated her out one of the stealth bucks, and I'll be gone before any pony can catch me, or even see who it was. You can blame it on a slaver assassin. Who wouldn't buy that? Especially if every pony knew the slavers were due to attack in mass next morning. Did I contemplate the plan while well, I stood there, feeling increasingly nervous? He had realized that this plan put him in the same crosshairs as Gilda. Godwinna. <clears throat> and he already thought of me as her spy. Would he believe I would just betray her so quickly? Was my loyalty just up for grabs? I like it! Deadeyes broke into a grin. He clapped his hoofs together. Just one stipulation. Uh-oh. This velvet of yours. I want to hear at least two songs before you interrupt the show. Including something by Sweetie Belle. Um, any particular one? He smiled. Hell, I love them all. He leaned back. Surprise me. As I walked out of Deadeye's office, I took another look around. I remembered how Deadeyes and his guards had gone off a different way just before I stole the ledger. Now I was unsurprised to find the passage led to stairs, which wrapped around to the balcony above. I looked it over, shadowed, occluded. It was a perfect sniping position. On my way back down the steps, I noticed a sickly apple-colored glow, which hadn't been there before. One of the terminals in one of the desks in the room outside Daddy's office was powered up. I wasn't sure I hadn't seen it before. Replacing those fuses and spark batteries must have powered it up. Pulling out my access tool, I hacked the terminal. There were no menus, no entries. Instead, just a single function. I found the terminal that opened the door to the mines and vault below. I'll put a bullet through Deadeye's head, I told Gowd, and another into your table, and then use a stealth buck to slip out before any pony can identify me. You can blame it on the slavers who are attacking tomorrow. Gowd was pondering the idea skeptically. Sure, some ponies still might have suspicions, but not the kind they could act on, particularly if you take over and lead them to victory against the slavers. God looked, or shook her head. I've got to hand it to you. You're one hell of a devious plotter. I felt a rush of pride, and then immediately questioned, as if enjoying such praise spoke good or ill of me. A few moments later, I joined Calamity and Velvet in the cattle car. Velvet Remedy was prancing around nervously. A show? With only hours to prepare? And why are we doing this again? Calamity was confused. Whose side are we on now? Same as before. The basic plan shouldn't change. But first, I want to get those two in the same room together. Velvet Remedy opened one of her saddlebags, pulling out a notebook. What songs do I do? Most of my music isn't really Raider appropriate. Somehow, I don't think songs about peace and love, nobility or freedom, are really their fare. Calamity whined. Well, most of them are escaped slaves. Old Remedy was checking down her list of songs. Well, that one's out. That one might work. Oh, that could be fun. But it was originally meant as a duet. I read an old magazine that Pinkie Pie and Vinyl Scratch had once performed at Hoofbeats. I could tweak it for one pony, but it really requires musical accompaniment. Maybe a good... Maybe a Velvet Remedy original? How about... I blinked, remembering. Well, Deadeyes was expecting two songs before the attack. He says one of them has to be a song by Sweetie Belle. Velvet huffed. And you were going to tell me this when? Uh, just now? She nickered. Great. Two songs. One by my great, great, 
etc., etc., grandmother, well, at least I know most of those by heart, but the other, I couldn't help but roll my eyes. As much as I adored Velvet Remedy's music, and fell in love with her in every song, tonight we were looking for a distraction. It didn't have to be perfect. You think y'all will be able to keep every set of eyes upon you? Calamity asked. Velvet Remedy looked painfully insulted. Why, of course, dear. There won't be an eye for any pony else in that room. I believed it. I believe Velvet Remedy could keep every eye on her, even if Ditsy Doo was in the audience. Suddenly, Velvet Remedy gasped. Every eye? I need a bath. Oh no, what am I going to wear? I can help with that. Velvet cocked her head. No, thank you. I can bed myself quite well enough, dear. I stammered, flushing hotly. That wasn't what I meant, but now that she said it, I couldn't drive the images out of my mind, and my heart fluttered in my chest. Clemity neighed and turned away. I'll give you two some private time for... He waved a hooth, foof between us. Whatever this is. He made a quick exit, muttering something about helping Galwood's ponies get their magical plasma cannon up and running before Red Eye's forces got here. I wasn't paying any attention. I only had eyes for Velvet Remedy, and I could feel my face burning. I... I stomped. I meant I have the perfect thing for you to wear. Focusing my magic, I opened my saddlebags and slid out the most beautiful dress in the wasteland. My find from Carousel Boutique. How can I fix this? How many times must I try? Please, this time, let me get it right. Get it right. Velvet Remedy was gorgeous. The dress was perfect on her, making her more stunning than I had ever seen her before. Her horn was aglow, and the stage was awash with warm, colored lights that shifted her voice in the mood of the song. I rear up my hooves, throw a buck in the air, and let firm resolve overwhelm my despair. She chose in her first number that same incredibly heartbreaking song from the radio. Something every pony would be familiar with. And she was more than doing it justice. She was magnificent. I crouched on the balcony, covering in the ever-disgusting mattress cover. Stats was ready, and my sniper rifle was loaded and tucked on my side. I actually hated myself for planning to ruin her performance. Dead Eyes hadn't been stupid. When I entered the balcony, I found a note had been left for me. One shot to the target, one to the table. The shot is rigged to explode if you shoot anything else. Even if I could get the message to Calamity, he was no better at disarming explosives than I was. Out of petty spite, I stole his copy of Applied Gemstones. Velvet Remedy drew the song to a tear-jerking close. The audience, scores of raider ponies, sat utterly stunned. Even Gawad's beak dropped open. There were several seconds of dense quiet, and the stage was going dark, save for the faintest glow from Velvet Remedy's horn. Then, an explosion of hoofbeats shook the mess hall, <clears throat> vibrating the balcony and sending bits of debris down from the roof as dozens of pony hoof stomped in applause. I caught Dead Eyes shooting a glance up at the balcony. Out of the corner of her eye, God caught it too. She dipped her beak into a tiny drinking cup, her gaze never leaving him. New music was beginning to swell from the stage, an orchestra in a single horn. Velvet Remedy began clopping a hoof on the stage, setting a rhythm, and soon most of the ponies in the hall were matching her stomp. Enough of this slow stuff. Who's here to party? She bellowed out, drawing a roar from the crowd. My ears were up, my eyes widened, and for a moment, 
I completely forgot about the sniper rifle at my side. All that mattered was that I didn't recognize this music. I'd never heard this song. Gallop don't trot. Night's burning hot. Don't make me wait to go. Band's playing loud. Screams of the crowd. And here's what feeds my soul. If you're not smiling, you're not trying. Start a riot. Don't be quiet. Hoof to the floor. Just give me more. I need my rock and roll. By Celestia's grace, she's going to set off any explosives under her stage herself. I floated up my sniper rifle. How terrified of letting her complete the song. With the light and sound now bursting from the stage, Velvet Remedy absolutely had every pony and Griffin's attention. By Luna, I could probably start shooting and no pony would notice until half the room was down. Well, if the stage didn't go up in a fireball. Don't be lazy, just go crazy. Don't you know that it's a party? Following the perfection of my Pip Bucks targeting spell, I locked on to a sequence of three targets. Blam! Blam! The first shot tore through the tin cup, splashing God with her drinking, and dug into the table. Before any pony could react, the second ripped off the top of Deadeye's head, splattering several of the ponies in front of him. My third target was Velvet Remedy, who glowed with a light not of her own, making as I telekinetically shoved her back through the heavy curtains and off the stage. True to Deadeye's word, the entire front of the stage detonated in a roar of fire and splinters, not a breath later. Waves of ponies in the front row fell, and I saw Gawad stagger, bleeding from wounded shrapnel. I activated him with a stealth buck and galloped silently towards the stairs. From some pony, I could, from below, I could hear some pony yelling, It's the slavers! They're attacking early! I, a completely flare assumption. I thought, as I hit the stairs, I was halfway down when an explosion from somewhere outside let me know the panicking pony hadn't been completely wrong. As I raced for the terminal, my mind bogged at the coincidence. <clears throat> but no. I realized as I got into the desk and activated the end of the terminal's single function, it wasn't coincidence at all. Dead Eye slavers weren't going to trust Dead Eyes, just as Dead Eyes planned to betray them. They must have always intended to attack early. And right now, every single pony was in here. In accordance with the plan, even Gaud was in attendance, <clears throat> as were her loyalists. We'd pull all the ponies into one place, and left the outskirts and guard posts undefended. Of course, they would attack now. The stealth buck was wearing off, just as I dashed into the room behind the curtains. I found Velvet Remedy pulling herself out of a pile of skeletons. Her perfect dress had bones hanging from it. Panting, I apologized, explaining about the note. She waved it off. Oh, that's quite all right. I'd much rather be buried in a pile of skeletons than actually join them. And with a smile that melted my, my heart. Thank you, little Pip. Then, as an afterthought, couldn't let me finish the song, though? Sheepishly, I was afraid you'd set off the explosives yourself. I looked back towards the curtains. From the flickering light around their edges, and the front side of the curtains was on fire. They were thick enough that the flames hadn't shooed their way through yet. I looked up. Black smoke was beginning to coat the ceiling. On the other side of the curtains, I heard gunfire and magical energy blasts being exchanged. I looked around for calamity. The rust-colored pegasus galloped in <clears throat> a moment later. His black cow pony hat nearly falling off. A key dragged from the train, from a chain between his teeth. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes with a laugh. You actually stopped to get the key? Clement turned his head, hooking the chain to one of the guns on his battle saddle. Hells yeah! He grinned to Velvet. Depend on who wins out there. I'm already making plans to swoop back in and loot the bodies. Velvet Remedy turned up her nose. Even I rolled my eyes. Then I turned and trotted for the gate. Come on. Clement bit the tip of my tail and stopped me. Whoa there, Dumplin'. 
He nodded, his head towards the gate. I turned to look. On the other side of the gate, between us and the open metal door, were four turrets pointed right at me. I groaned. Turning back the power on, I had turned on the turrets too. How could I have been so stupid as to not realize that would happen? I could have disabled them before, when it was safe. We take all four at once? Calamity asked. No, hold on. Let me think. Why are we still going down there anyway? Velvet asked, clearly assuming the rest of the plan was a bust. I was tempted to agree, now more than anything. I'm kind of hoping there's a back way out. I left my pit buck and looked at it. Okay, we're in luck. I've got one more stealth buck, and I can use it to get up to the turrets and reprogram them, just like the ones back in the Pegasus convoy. That way, they'll let us through and keep any pony who gets the idea to follow us. We had a plan. I pulled the dead stealth buck out of my pit buck and slotted in my last one, then got to work. We found ourselves creeping through caves, converted into storage, and piled with crates emblazoned with the same or the name Shattered Hoof Reeducational Stockyard. A few were marked with a circle proclaiming them Celestia Tier property and branded with either the initials MAS or MWT. Well, I whispered conversationally to my companions, I know MAS is the Mr. Ministry of Magic, but I don't know the other one. Calamity stopped, an expression of confusion clouding his face. How does... Ministry of Arcane Sciences, Velvet Remedy explained casually before he heard something. A voice, low and deep, rumbled through the caves, bringing us all to a halt. So, you've you're the little ponies who have come to my town and made such a mess of things. You've killed my lieutenant, and now you've come for me. Mr. Topaz? Calamity asked, echoing my own thoughts. Either he was using an impressively well-hidden speaker system, or he was using magic to augment his voice. I suspected the latter. And that probably meant a unicorn. Or a horse that he struck me. One of those pseudo-goddess things like the creature from Appaloosa. And here I was, all out of boxcars. I quickly passed out the magical ammo, giving a prayer to Celestia and the other to Luna. If Mr. Topaz was really one of those monsters, we'd need all the divine assistance we could get. Calamity quickly changed his, the load of his battle saddle. Nova Remedy, however, looked unimpressed. Her horn began to glow, and then she opened her mouth. Her voice cried out from every rock and timber in the mines. Not impressed. Her knicker rang off the walls. Velvet Remedy turned down the awesome until her voice was only a little more terrifying than his. Now, why don't you be polite, stop playing games, and come out to say hello? I floated up little Macintosh and prepared for the appearance of what I had now convinced myself was one of those pseudo-goddesses as the orange-scaled dragon loomed around the corner, licking his teeth, I realized I was so very wrong. Well, Calamity shouted as his wings propelled him down the corridor faster than Velvet Remedy or I could gallop. At least he's not a full-grown dragon. I poured on the speed, somehow managing to keep up with Velvet Remedy. Calamity was right, but for what good that did us. Mr. Topaz was slightly smaller than a train car, not counting his sharply spiked tail. He could swallow me in one bite. But for Calamity, he might require two, but I didn't see how that benefited him much. Using my magic, I ripped another support beam out of the wall as we raced past. I could hear rocks crashing down as the ceiling caved in. I wasn't stopping him but at least I was slowing him down enough to stay ahead of those teeth. We could have tried diplomacy, Velvet cried out as she ran for her life, if Calamity hadn't shot him first. My breathing had become labored, 
and stitches of fire were growing through my lungs. I could hear Mr. Topaz tearing through the newest collapse. Left ahead, I gasped. I was able to stop and check my pit box auto map, but my eyes forward sparkle compass indicated we were circling around. At least we know the new ammo works. Calamity spun in pace, firing off twin shots at the dragon, then took a hard left, disappearing around the corner. We followed, not far behind. The hall we had just left turned into an inferno, and the walls shaked from the dragon's roar. The ammo was working. The shots punched right through the dragon's armored hide, but he was so big that they mostly just seemed to make him mad. Without slowing, Velvet laughed as we ran past a large metal door. Well, there's your vault. Any point you want to stop to open it? Smart asked rhetorical question. Calamity stopped at the next junction, hovering in a nicely controlled panic. Little Pip, which way? Uh, should be right this time. At least, I really hoped so. If not, I was sending us to a dead end. With an extra stress on dead. Calamity disappeared down the right passage. Luna and Celestia were with us, and the choice had been right. The passageway led us to the first tunnel. Recognizing it, Calamity had already flown back into Shattered Hoof, where the battle had been ablaze between raiders and slavers. Velvet Remedy was next out, but at that race to the door, Mr. Topaz finally wrote, caught up. He opened his huge maw, teeth glistening. A drop of saliva fell onto my neck, and the turrets opened fire as I raced through them. The dragon screamed. The sounds rocked the mess hall and brought a temporary halt to the fighting as every pony turned to stare at the now quiet, wounded, and extremely pissed off dragon as Mr. Topaz blasted all four turrets with fire. Internal components melted with static, and they stopped. I felt the fire wash over me, and my coat blackened, and my skin blistered under the heat. One of my saddlebags had caught fire. My heart was pounding like it was going to explode. My sides burned from exertion. I tried to yell at the others, but I couldn't get breath. I wasn't going to make it outside before I collapsed. I veered away from the others as the fire began to spread from my saddlebags to the harness that held my sniper rifle. I was running for a hallway too narrow for the dragon. And behind me, the mess hall was washed in flames. Mr. Topaz was burning to death. Slaver, slaver and raider ponies alike. And then, the dragon was gone. I collapsed against a wall of the washroom, two corridors away from the mess hall, panting hard. Water filled the sink next to me, soaking my saddlebags and pouring to the floor next to me. It felt cool against my burned, tortured skin, and I flopped over and wallowed in the forming puddle, wishing I could drip every part of me that hurt into it. I was crying. I tried not to think of how much it hurt, to focus elsewhere. It wasn't easy. The dragon, I assumed, had headed back down into the mines. He could fly around the mess hall he wanted, but the rest of the halls were too narrow for him. He was probably born down there, or Velvet Remedy collapsed next to me, breathing heavily. It was nothing short of miraculous that neither of us were more gravely injured much less dead. I tried to get up, but now that stopped. My legs were refusing to work again. Where's the dragon? I panted, searching for confirmation of my theory. The old remedy shook her head. She didn't know. Where's Calamity? I don't know. Lost track. Damn it. Clemente wasn't foolish enough to go back down there after him, or the vault, was he? No, of course not. He just got separated, that's all. But if the slavers and raiders were still going at each other in the yard, <clears throat> it wasn't safe to stand around at the rendezvous point. Would he fly back to Junction R7, or wait for us here, or engage the ponies in fighting? Oh, blessed Luna. Little Pip? Velvet Remedy, as exhausted as she was, held her ears alert. I had realized that the giant hole torn in the razor wire over the yard must have been the work of the dragon, 
And that led me to the cargo elevator. The dragon's going to come up through the rock yard. I hissed in pain as I tried to move. Velvet Remedy looked at me with alarm. Little Pip, here, let me... She weakly opened one of the yellow medical boxes she used as saddlebags and pulled out the very last of our healing bandages, as well as a syringe. This will dull the pain, she panted slowly. Trust me, you'll need it. She was right. Pain, the painkiller helped, but I screamed anyway. When Velvet Remedy had finished, I felt lightheaded, and my vision was blurred with tears. I moaned weakly, and my knees trembled as I finally got to my hooves. Little Pip, you're in no condition. But there was no conviction in Velvet Remedy's voice, just sorrow. She knew as well as I that we couldn't stay here, and she knew I had to find and help Calamity. Do we have any buck in our supplies? I bit my lower lip, hating to ask her such a thing. Velvet Remedy spared me her usual gasp of disapproval, simply bringing out the bottle and passing me the yellowish orange pills inside. Thanks, I whispered, floating them into my mouth. I stuck my head under the waterfall, spilling out of the faucet, and swallowed them without chewing. It took a few moments, long enough that I feared it wasn't going to have the effect I needed. A burst of energy flooded through me. I felt stronger, faster, less exhausted, and more awake. This. This was good. This would definitely do. I lifted my silk saddlebag out of the sink and back onto my flanks, hissed as they rubbed against the bandaged skin. On second thought, I thought, lifting it off and letting it float beside me. Turning to Velvet Remedy, I made an effort from keeping to keep from sounding bossy. Velvet, would you please try and find Calamity? Just be careful and don't get caught by any pony. She nodded. What are you going to try and do, little Pip? I glanced back at the door. I'm going back down, and I'm going to find that vault. If we're lucky, there'll be something inside that'll give us a chance against that dragon. But, Velvet Remedy frowned. Little Pip, you don't have the key. With a smile, when have I ever needed a key to get past a lock? The mess hall was a slaughterhouse. The charred flame of the stage had been licked with flame, and the air was choked with smoke. The smell of roasted ponies, some of them still on fire, tried to strangle me. I was in a hurry, but I still, but I still took the time to wag a few of the random, less damaged weapons from the floor before I made my way down the heat-twisted gate at Slager Turrets. Behind me, the flame-broiled crossbeam that had once held the stage curtains came crashing down. I made my way towards the vault. Turning a corner, I found myself face to face with a pony in leather armor, wielding a magical energy lance. I couldn't tell which side she'd been on, but it didn't matter. She immediately dropped into a combative stance. Wait! She thrust the going tip of the lance at me. I tried to dodge, and my side slammed in the cave wall. A line of stinging agony swept across the side of my neck. My flesh bubbled and melted. Ah! The pony backed up, swinging the tip of the magical lance towards my head. I dropped to my belly, and the lance passed over me, and flung my saddlebags into her face. The pony stumbled back. As she recovered, I kicked into sats, and aimed one of the magical weapons at her. My heart sank as I realized it was a magical energy rifle, and I had no idea how to fire it. The pony thrust the lance towards my eyes, and I swung the rifle into his path, deflecting it. The rifle hissed and warped where the lance's tip connected. I dropped everything I was floating and charged the pony, heading down. She swung the lance again, but I was inside its reach, and the shaft slapped against my side with enough force to bruise through an armored utility bargain, but not enough to knock me off course. My horn punched through her armor and buried itself deep into her chest. I felt the lance bounce off my head as it dropped from her mouth. She tried to pull back, but I pushed forward, 
until I felt her weakened and her body becoming dead weight. I stepped back, my horn coated in blood, and the pony fell on my feet, still breathing shallowly. I felt the blood trickle down my head, and I fell and fell into my left eye, tinting my sight with scarlet. Weakly, she whimpered, I don't want to die. I cringed. I tried to blink the blood out of my eye, but instead, more drops fell in, blurred my vision. It's too late. I'm sorry. I was honestly. I can't save you. I contemplated breaking her neck. She was already dead. Why make her suffer? I raised my hoof and stepped over her. I just couldn't do that. No matter what, I was allowing the wasteland to make me. It hadn't changed me that much yet. I walked down the shaft a few more feet and then stopped and turned. I flooded my saddlebags to me, opening them and drying out my blanket. I gently laid it across her. Then I floated the weapons up from the ground leaving the magical energy rifle, but adding her lands to my collection. I didn't have any further trouble before reaching the vault. The tumblers fell into place, and the metal door to the vault unlocked with a click. And then, all the alarms went off. Apparently, when I didn't need a key to the, open the door, I didn't need to do so quietly. I planted my fort hooves on the heavy metal door, and strained, pushing it open. Something I almost certainly couldn't have done if I wasn't hyped on Buck. I stepped into the darkness beyond and focused, increasing the light from my horn to illuminate the room. There were many things I had been expecting, and this wasn't one of them. The room was filled from top to bottom with shelves of memory orbs. Each orb was tagged with a date and a guest number. There must have been hundreds of them. My ears dropped. There wasn't anything in here that would help me against. Well, well, aren't you insistent? I spun around. Mr. Topaz was crouched at the door of the vault, the dragon's head sinking in. He was too broad at the shoulders to fit, but he completely blocked my only exit. At one breath of fire, would incinerate everything in the vault. I was on my way up to chomp a few of your friends outside, particularly that delicious-looking Pegasus, when you just had to ring the dinner bell. I was able to back out, just out of chomping range, before my tail hit the back shelf, sending a memory orb falling to the floor. I looked around frantically, but there was no place to hide or flee. You just had to get yourself eaten first. I admire the perseverance. The dragon joked wickedly. F first Mr. Topaz was sadistic, but at least he was talkative. If I could keep him speaking, maybe I could figure a way out. I tried racking my brain for some telekinetic trick I could save my hide. The gemstones of the desert are dessert, of course. You ponies are the main course. The dragon scold, scowled, making me want to scream. Of course. You went and mucked everything up. I spent all this time and effort ensuring a harvest perfect for a final pre-sleep meal. And now, most of them are dead. His glare was filled with hatred. You little ponies taste so much better alive. I backpedaled, pressing myself into a shelf and knocking down dozens of the little magical orbs which scattered across the floor, rolling in all directions. The dragon's gaze was drawn momentarily to one of the rolling balls. What exactly were you expecting to find in here? Mountains of gems? Because you thought I'd enjoy needing to call down that imbecile dead eyes every time I got a bit peckish? Did you even look in the crates? N no He laughed, the breath of his momentary heating the room until I felt I would faint. I lost all focus. My saddlebags and collected weapons clattered to the ground. I glanced at them with amusement. Or was it weapons? Did you hope to find some magical shotgun of dragon slaying down here, perhaps? Because there would 
ever be any dragon suicidal enough to keep something like that around the house. N n no I said again, although this time he had been fairly right in the nose. The dragon reached into the room and flicked one of the orbs at me with a claw. Go ahead. Try one. You died for this, after all. <clears throat> I was going to die. Hesitantly, I reached a hoof towards one of the orbs, but then drew back. I was sweating profusely. The heat in the room was draining my strength. Soon, I wouldn't be able to stand. And still, the only strategy I had was to keep him talking. What, what are they? Confessions, the dragon smiled cruelly. Seems the old mayor of your Ministry of Morale didn't exactly trust normal methods of interrogation. Some incident in her youth or something. So instead, they trained up unicorns like yourself to sift through other ponies' memories, find them condemning thoughts or experiences, and rip them out for public record. Didn't want any innocent ponies getting into Shattered Hoof, after all. What? Well, but that's... Of course. Not every pony came out of the process in the same condition they went in, mentally speaking. But what is it you ponies say? Can't bake a pie without dicing some apples? He laughed again. This time, I did lose consciousness. Only for a moment, I think. But I found myself laying on the floor, with no memory of falling. That's awful. The dragon stopped laughing. You see, little pony? Look at what you ponies are doing to each other up there. Look at what you did to each other in here. What makes you think your pathetic, wicked species is worth being anything more than dragon food? I tried to get up. I just couldn't. The heat was making all my burns blaze in agony. I felt like I was on fire again. Only this time, it was worse. I cried out. The dragon was going to eat me. There were no other options. No tricks. No way out. I was going to die here. Like this. Alone. In a tiny metal room. Underneath a prison. But still. I tried to answer. N not all of us are bad. Some of us are good. The dragon snorted, adding some smoke to the heat. Yeah, I can see that. He was staring at me, and it took a moment for me to realize that he was staring at my horn. The heat had caked the blood. Mockingly, he offered, Well, I suppose some of you are good, with ketchup. Makes you little ponies nice and slippery going down. I cringed, fearing he would laugh again. The air was almost too hot to breathe. Although personally, I prefer mustard. The mine shaft outside erupted in green liquid fire, the blast catching the dragon on the side with enough force to yank his head out of the room, sending him sprawling. Yeehaw! Blessed cool air swam into the room, clearing my head. That was Calamity's voice. How'd you like them apples? Calamity flapped into view, carrying the magical plasma cannon from Junction R7. Hey, little Pip, boy am I glad to see you're okay. Sorry it took me so long to get back here. These things are heavy when not properly mounted. The monstrous tri-barreled weapon was bigger than he was, and strapped to his underbelly with its power array attached to the top of his battle saddle with a rope. I found myself giggling half hysterically. <laughs> you look ridiculous. Yeah, well, Calamity's voice cut off. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. What? He's getting back up. Run. Run was a bit more than I could manage. A third of my body felt like it was going to be held to a flame. I staggered, trying to focus. My saddlebags lifted. Calamity fired again, the blast from the clan obliterating the air, and kicking, ascending the Pegasus pony, hurling backwards. Dragon roared in pain and rage. Glorious Luna, what does it take to kill one of these things? Telekinetically, I grabbed the rest of my possessions and dashed out the door. Calamity was biting after the ropes holding the cannon. I can't carry you on this at the same time. I looked back. The dragon was badly wounded, possibly mortally, 
One of his wings was warped and deformed. The scales on his side had melted back against his ribs, and one of the, his legs had deformed a stump. And still, he was getting back up. His eyes filled with rage. He opened his mouth to bellow fire, and the fire was only a function of the blast he had managed before. I felt a wave of superheated air that rode in front of us, but the flames didn't reach us. Moments later, Calamity was pulling me through the air, up and out of the hole left by the lowering hydraulic cargo lift, and into the cloudy sky. We shot past Gawad, engaged in brutal aerial combat with the two griffins from the slaver camp. Out of the corner of my bloodshot eye, I saw her draw that magical energy shotgun and empty a point blank into the beast of one of her opponents. Beneath us, the chaos of warring ponies filled the rock yard, explosions and bursts of magical energy forming a violent dance of carnage around the dark, hollow square of the lift. The dragon impossibly followed. Even with its ruined wing, the dragon was faster than we were, tearing through the hole in the razor mesh in pursuit of us. Calamity would have been more maneuverable had his wing been fully healed and he wasn't carrying the extra weight. As it was, we were a two-plony flying brick. As the dragon flew closer, Mr. Topaz opened his maw wide. Glancing back, I saw rows of viciously sharp teeth surrounded by a dark, insatiable gullet. I had an idea. <clears throat> Keep flying straight. Calamity grunted, straining his wings for more speed. I hope you know what you're doing. I opened my saddlebags and pulled out a few of my grenades. All of them. I noted, with terror tinged amusement, that they really did look like metal apples. How do you like... I whispered, as I let go of everything but the stems, sending the grenades right into the dragon's ravenous throat. Even as they disappeared, it occurred to me that they may... that I may have made a terrible mistake. Dragons can breathe fire and eat gems. What made me think a few grenades would cause him more than indigestion. A moment later, I learned my reservations were right, as the grenades did absolutely no harm to the healthy parts of the dragon but blew out his damaged side, warped and deteriorated by potent assaults of magical plasma in a blast of sick gore. Mr. Topaz, a gaping hole in his side, larger than three full ponies, was almost certainly dead before he hit the ground, messily, and skidded thirty yards, leaving a swath of blood and internal fluids. Clemity turned and banked, taking us back to the dunk junction, there were still battles raging in parts of Shattered Hoof, but we both had enough excitement for the night. Oh, horse apples, Clamity said wearily. I almost forgot about Velvet Remedy. Before I could panic, he informed me. She's hid herself in the visitor center. I told her I'd be right back for her. Gently, he sat me down, then flapped back into the night, looking utterly exhausted. I sat there, waiting for him to turn, and at some point, I fell asleep. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Sniper pony. Your chance of hitting an enemy's head in sats is increased by 25%.